Welcome to Forbes Newsroom. I'm Kat Oriel, and today I'm joined with Tim Marks, the president of Topple, the world's only sustainability-focused blockchain. Tim, thank you for joining me today. Can you tell me what your company does? What is its mission, and how does it seek to achieve that? Well, thank you very much, Kat. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. The story of Topple is a complicated one, right? Um, because at, at its core, Topple is two businesses in one at this point. Right. The vision from Topple started with the idea of how do we help impact and sustainable, sustainably driven companies right, prove the impact they're having right, and help monetize that in ways that they are then encouraged to and able to do more good. Right? To do that, we built a layer one blockchain protocol, much like you would say Ethereum or Cardano, uh, Solana, et cetera. That, um, but at the same time, what's different about Topple is we built our first customer. We built our first uh, you know, kind of user on the blockchain, Topple Solutions. And Topple Solutions makes blockchain-based products that help our users prove the impact they're having and monetize that so they can then, again, do more good for the world. And so that's the difference about Topple. You, know, you see a lot of blockchains out there that build the layer one blockchain, and then they just start go looking for you know, users and say, hey, how are you going to be able to use this? We have an idea, but you guys come figure it out. Right, Topple built that blockchain and then went one step further and said, let's build our first user. Let's show people and showcase how we want our blockchain to be used. And now we're in the process of, you know, not only commercializing the products we build on the Topple solution side, but we're also you know, onboarding um, several dozen builders to build directly and natively on the blockchain. And for people that might not be aware, can you explain, give me over one minute or so, Shviel, about what exactly a blockchain is? In one minute, that's going to be tough. But I think the at its core, and to try to move us out of you know thinking about blockchain and blocks and the like, right? blockchain is a ledger, right? and it's a, a ledger that is distributed and immutable. And so the way I like to think about it, or uh, talk to people that you know really have no idea what blockchain is, just imagine an Excel spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet that had on its first tab a ledger, right? But instead of having that owned by one person and controlled by one person on their hard drive, there were 1,000, 10,000 copies of that distributed all over the world. And then for anybody that wanted to come right to that ledger, right, as long as they, uh, they need to follow a certain protocol to be able to write to that ledger, but then the, um, the protocol goes out and asks, right, and looks for a consensus, what we call consensus, from you know, a lot of the different computers that are holding a copy of the ledger. Assuming the person that wants to write to the ledger follows the rules correctly, that will get written to the blockchain, right? That will get written to the ledger. But instead of rewriting over it and then hitting the save button, it saves the new version of the ledger in a separate tab, right? The very next tab. And then the next time somebody writes to the blockchain, um, you know, it opens and has another tab. So if you think just those tabs are adding on to the ledger, that's the equivalent of the blocks. And it just eventually forms a chain of blocks that not only has the current updated version of the ledger, but it has all the previous copies. So it makes it immutable and tamper proof. And once you've written something, you can't unwrite it. That's a very helpful example. I feel like I now understand what a blockchain is. So pivoting a little bit, let's talk about COP27. Last week, leaders from all over the world gathered for the UN's annual climate change summit. What was the mood going into COP27, considering the war in Ukraine is still ongoing? Global inflation has put climate into the rear view for many nations. I think the sentiment going in was that and, and it had been talked about, this was going to be a uh, COP of implementation, right? That we were going to, yes, there have been a lot of things that happened since uh, COP26. And, you know, yes, there's a lot of reasons uh, that, you know, a lot of the momentum had been challenged, but nevertheless, we still need to move on, right? We still need to pick up the pieces because the planet's not getting any cooler, shall we say. And so there was really an expectation that a lot of things would go from just kind of the um, workshop and programming into the, all right, these are firm commitments and this is how we're going to get it done. Have you found that there are any companies that have actually lived up to their promises and followed up on those commitments since COP26? I'm sure there are plenty that have, right? And, and I'm sure there is many that haven't. And so versus talking about individual companies that I would feel a little less comfortable doing so, 
No, I would just say that the trend, we're still moving the wrong way, right? Uh, we have to, to, to meet the uh, Paris Agreement goals and the like, you know, we need to have gotten to you know, peak, uh, our peak at 2025 uh, when it comes to fossil fuels and the like. And the most recent reports are showing you know, trending upwards you know, until at least 2030. And so if you just look at the curves around usage, you know, we're not really materially impacting that at all. Um, coal usage is at all time high, as is gas usage, uh, petroleum usage is near all time highs and, you know, having rebounded from uh, the pandemic. And so if you, if you look at that, yes, you could take the, you know, glass half full that the uh, renewables have been able to come on and take all of, or most of, right, the new energy demands, et cetera, et cetera, but it hasn't stopped the march of fossil fuels. And so as a world, shall we say, we're, we're coming up a bit short. That being said, what, how does Topple come in? How does your company plan to hold these leaders accountable for their climate pledge, pledges? Is that even realistic? Is it possible to hold them accountable? Well, our job is not necessarily to hold them accountable ourselves. It's allow them to hold themselves accountable, right? Because we're not out there saying you have to do or do not or not do anything. But what the blockchain or blockchain-based products allow is for people that are going to make claims for them to go prove it in an immutable fashion. And so if you want to say, I'm going to do A, B, C, D when it comes to climate change, make those pledges, make those claims, make them specific, right? And then use new technologies, blockchain being one of them, to be able to really follow up and say, are you or are you not doing what you said you were able to do um, and that you were going to do? And we really think that's what it is, right? We don't put the targets on anybody. We don't tell them what to do, nor do we even suggest what they should do. But we do provide the infrastructure for those that are making these claims to say, not only am I going to make the claims, I'm going to prove it. Are you hopeful that companies will actually hold up their end of the bargain after COP27? Hopeful always, yes, 100%. You know, and I think uh, it's both companies, but it's governments and the like. The hard part is that it's easy to make 30-year commitments, right? The hard part is making commitments to next year's budget that prioritize some of the actions that we need to implement now in order to make those 30-year commitments, right? Versus doing something that might be a little politically more favorable in a given environment, right? Which is, uh, and so, you know, to me, that's the problem. Do I, do I think that companies do want to make these commitments? I think they do, but I think right now there's so much pressure to say things but there's not as much pressure to actually say, what is the implementation path that's going to get us there? And how am I going to be help hold myself as well as how are we all going to hold ourselves accountable? When you think about the U.S. and the commitments that they've made, especially ahead of the midterm elections, how do you feel like the midterm elections have played a role in the United States promises and what they're actually hopefully able to get done in terms of climate change? I think it remains to be uh, said. Uh, I do think that you know, with a certain leadership changes, right, there might be less of a focus on you know, the environment, uh, at least from, say, the House of Representatives. There's been all, already some you know, talk about, right, is there a way to curl, curtail, curl, curtail excuse me, some of you know, the environmentally focused or environmentally first initiatives, right? Um, but at the same time, again, it remains to be seen. Um, I think the United States and you know, other leading industrialized nations have an obligation to lead, and, and hopefully they do. But I think more to the point of what's exactly going to happen now, right? It's the problem that you know, when you need to make these generational long commitments, there can be whipsaws in what governments do depending on a given election, and that can set you know, everything back with years, if not decades. Right? I mean, the United States is an example of having entered and then gotten out of and then gotten back into the Paris Accords, right? But at the same time, it's not limited to the United States. Um, you know, President Brazil just showed up to say Brazil's back, right? After a period in which uh, Brazil was not particularly focused on the environment. 
But a country like Brazil with, you know, all the rainforest and all of the uh, needs to protect, well, you know, the Amazon is also often referred to the world's lungs, right? Taking five, six years off is not really a, it's not really acceptable, right? It's not going to get us to where we need to get to. So I think, you know, versus the United States, it's how do we come up with a way in which we can incentivize these long-term plans, put these uh, plans into motion and hold ourselves accountable so that, you know, one election uh, in different parts of the world doesn't absolutely just alter the course of, you know, the action that we're taking to help save the environment. Is there something that you would like to see private companies or even private citizens do to help play their part in combating climate change? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think this, you know, at the end of the day, right, and government can and should be representatives of the people. And so just expect more, want more, demand more. You know, from a consumer point of view, there are tools um, now in technology that they can demand so that the companies that are providing them goods can tell them more about where the goods come from, how they were made, right? How sustainable or not they are. And to the extent that you know, consumers ask this to companies, companies will give it to them, right? And I think that is the best way in which we can tackle this because we get focused a lot on the governments. And of course, the governments have the biggest amount of you know, budgets to spend. And they're a lot of times the representatives at these types of you know, uh, organizations and summits and the like. But really, if it's the average person, the average consumer that says, no, this is enough, I demand to know. And I know that you know, there is technology that will help me know, the companies will give it to them. And that is what will effectuate change. So I'm really hopeful that the private sector will take the lead here because that's something that is not right open to just changes every election cycle. And my last question is, why is it important to act now? What are the implications? You know, what's the timeline that we're working on if we do not take action now on climate change? I'll defer to the scientists for the actual numbers because you know I'm not a climate, uh, climate scientist myself. Well, I will say two things. One, I often laugh sometimes when we're talking about uh, we're saving the planet, right? In a way, at least from my point of view, the planet's going to be fine, right? I think we're saving ourselves by doing this. The planet's been around for 5 billion years, and by all accounts, it's going to be around for another 5 billion more. It's gone through bigger ups and downs than you know, one or two degrees of um, you know, warming and the like, and it's regenerated itself. So I think the planet ultimately will be fine, at least in my point of view. We have to save ourselves and our ability to live on this planet. And so I think nothing short of that is at stake. And what needs to be done now? We just need actionable plans. I mean, I was talking, I was looking at the, um, you know, the commitments from, that are coming out of COP27. I saw yesterday when I was on the uh, website, and they were talking about it being a you know, biodiversity day and talking about a joint work program that was being implemented. And then there was a note about $172 million of initial pledges, uh, excuse me, additional pledges, you know, that were made to one of the programs. But I mean, really, if, if that's what we're getting right out of this, like, we need more. And so, you know, what do we need? We need bigger commitments, but we also need just implementation plans that then get measured. Right? I mean, there's the famous you know, saying that's often attributed to a lot of different people, but what gets measured gets managed. And if we're not willing to measure things and really hold ourselves accountable, there's no expectation or no way to really expect that we're going to move the needle here. Thank you. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we didn't get to touch on yet? Perhaps one thing, and you know, I think that a lot of times we're talking about you know, COP27, 26, and you know, a lot of commitments. It's easy to focus on what's not being done. It's easy to focus on the shortfall. It's easy to focus on the fact that we're moving in the wrong direction. And, and that's all true, but I really do see pockets of just you know, exceptional um, innovation, right? Exceptional entrepreneurs out there and people that are really working, the brightest minds that are really working to help fix this and solve this. So despite the fact you know, of a lot of the warnings around, yeah, we're moving in the wrong direction. This is an all-time high. That's an all-time high. We need more. We need more. We need more. I really am optimistic overall 
about our ability to you know, innovate and our ability to really drive change and our ability to ultimately band together to you know, make this work and to you know, fix this for the betterment of ourselves and all of humanity. So, I mean, despite, you know, kind of how uh, some of the initial conversation went, I truly am an optimist and I do feel like we're going to be fine, but we just can't keep our foot off the pedal and really need to uh, push on this because that's what it's going to take. Thank you so much for joining me today, Tim. Thank you, Kat. Have a great